Let's go through the procedure for finding the rotational inertia of an object. If you follow my three steps, you'll be in good shape. Step number one is check the table in the textbook. Maybe you'll get lucky and it's there and you'll be done at that point. Let's take a look at this example. We want to find the rotational inertia of a door rotating about its hinge. So something like this. If you look at it from the end, the top view looking down at the door or a front view looking at the door swinging in and out. That's what we're trying to find. Total mass of the door M with W height H. And what do we do? We check the table. As we look at the table, we see there's the situation we're interested in. The door, flat rectangular object, rotating about one axis. And we can see that the rotational inertia is one-third m a squared, where a is the width of the door, the dimension that comes off of the axis of rotation. You might notice something familiar about that. Remember what we got for a rod rotating about its endpoint? one-third ml squared, the length of the rod. This is one-third m a squared, where a is the length of the door away from the axis of rotation. It's the same situation. The rod rotating about this point is exactly the same as the door rotating about the hinge. We don't care that we've taken the mass and spread it out along the axis of rotation. That doesn't do anything to the rotational inertia. What matters is how is the mass distributed about the axis of rotation. And for this door and for a rod, the mass is distributed exactly the same way about the axis of rotation. If you spread it out along the axis of rotation, it doesn't matter. The same is true with a flat disc and a solid cylinder. If you just have a flat disc, the rotational inertia is one half mr squared. If you take that mass and you spread it out along the axis of rotation and turn that flat disk into a solid cylinder, you still have one half mr squared. The mass is still distributed exactly the same way about the axis of But let's get back to our problem. We're trying to find the rotational inertia of a door. So we're gonna use one third m w squared, the width of the door, squared. So this is step number one in finding the rotational inertia. Just check the table. We got lucky. It was in the table. We're done. Now let's take a look at this example. We have a solid disk rotating about an axis of rotation that passes through the rim, the edge of the disk. So we say to ourselves, let's take a look at our table and see if that's in the table. Here's the table. And the only solid disk we have is this one. And it's rotating through its center point, through an axis of rotation that's the same as the axis of the cylinder, not through an axis of rotation at the edge of the cylinder like this red line. So that brings us to step two in finding the rotational inertia. We try step one, it didn't work. So now we go to step two. Can we use the table in the textbook in conjunction with the parallel axis theorem? And in this case, the answer is yes, because our disc is rotating about this axis of rotation, but there's an axis parallel to this one that goes through the center of mass of the disc, we can look that up in the table. 
So this is the axis of interest. This is the one parallel to it through the center of mass of the disk. And this is in the table. So if step number one doesn't work, proceed to step two. Step two is see if you can use the table in conjunction with the parallel axis theorem to find I. So in this case, we found a solid cylinder rotating about its center point. One half mr squared is the rotational inertia of this object. So we say I about the axis of rotation that we're interested in is equal to I about the center of mass plus m d squared. And we just looked this up. This is one half mr squared. And what is d in this case? Our axis through the center of mass is there. So d is just equal to the radius of our disk. So in this case, we get 3 halves mr squared. Now let's take a look at this example. We're trying to find the rotational inertia of a thin rod with a non-uniform mass density. So the rod is located between 0 and L on the x-axis. Total length L, total mass m. And it has a mass density, lambda, that changes with position. As you move out toward the end of the rod, as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the rod becomes more and more dense. So if we cut off a chunk off the end closest to x equals l, it would weigh more than if we cut off the same length at the part of the rod closer to x equals 0. The density is not uniform. If we cut the same size chunk off each end, they don't weigh the same amount. So lambda is equal to some constant. I'm just going to call it alpha times x. x is the position along the rod. As we move along the rod, it becomes more and more dense. Lambda equals alpha x. So we look at our procedure. We check the table. Well, I can tell you right now, there's no object in that table with a non-uniform mass density. So it's not there. And we can't even use the table with the parallel axis there because there's no object in that table with a non-uniform mass density. So what do we do? We go to our third and final step, a last resort. We integrate to find I. So let's take a look at that for this example. We pick some arbitrary location for our dm. And we say i is going to be the integral of r squared dm. And what is r? r is the distance from dm to our axis of rotation. So maybe you've noticed by now, if you put your axis of rotation located at the origin, then r is just equal to x in this case. I guess I should tell you where the axis of rotation is in this problem. Let's make it the end of the rod. So our axis of rotation will be here. It helps if you know where the axis of rotation is. I should have told you that right off the bat. Okay, so there's our uh, situation. And this distance here is r, which we will call x because uh, we've aligned it with the x-axis. The length of that little dm chunk is dx and dm is going to be lambda times dx. Now we ask ourselves, is lambda constant? If it is, it comes out of the integral. In this case, it is not. So what do we do? We plug in the function that we're given for lambda. So this is going to be equal to the integral of x squared alpha x dx, where that's our lambda. What are our limits of integration? We have to integrate over the whole rod. It starts at x equals 0, and it goes to l. 
alpha is a constant, it comes out of the integral. And I have the integral of x cubed dx from 0 to L. one-fourth alpha L to the fourth. If you want to, we can solve for alpha in terms of M. Let's find alpha. Well, we know that the total mass of the rod is the sum of all the little chunks that make up the rod. So if we integrate all the dms, we add up all the dms, we get M, the total mass of the rod. And what is dm? It's lambda dx, and lambda is alpha x. So we get the mass is equal to alpha x squared over 2, evaluated from 0 to L. And alpha is going to be 2m over L squared. So we can plug that in to alpha over here. And we get 1 quarter 2m over L squared, which is what alpha is, L to the fourth. I have 1 half m L squared. Let's think about this for a second and see if it makes sense. We did a rod rotating about its end point with uniform density. And what did we get? 1 third m L squared. And this rod has more and more mass out at the end, far away from the axis of rotation. So we would expect I for this rod to be bigger than the rotational inertia for a rod with uniform mass density rotating about its endpoint. And it is. One half is bigger than one third. So our answer makes sense. Just to recap, finding the rotational inertia of an object Number one, look in the table that's given to you in the formula sheet or in the textbook. See if it's there. Maybe you get lucky, it's there, you're done. If not, go on to step two. See if you can use that table in conjunction with the parallel axis theorem. That's gonna work 90% of the time. And if that doesn't work, go to step three, integrate over the object and find I the hard way by direct integration.